Hello, and welcome back to CS615 System Administration. This is week 5, segment 1, and we are starting a longer discussion on networking. In the coming videos, we'll dive down into the details of TCP IP networking on a Unix system. In the process, we'll travel up and down both the 4 layer TCP IP stack, the 7 layer OSI model, discover just how exactly the Unix system figures out how to talk to other systems, and learn a bit about the physical structure of the Internet as well as a few parts of its governance. These videos may well cover parts of topics you've already learned in other classes, but I believe that we should be able to learn something new in each of them still. So why don't we get started with the most familiar layers, off the OSI stack. I'm sure you've all seen this before. It's how we oftentimes attempt to represent the different functional parts of a communications network. From the bottom up, we have the physical and data link layers, which in the TCP IP 4 layer model are combined. Here we're talking about the physical medium and the bitrate, full duplex, half duplex, etc. And the node-to-node -node transfer of the data using this medium. Then there's the network layer, where we're moving packets between different networks. On top of that is the transport layer, where things start to get a bit shady, because most of TCP fits in here, but TCP also includes features that OSI would classify as belonging in the session layer. But honestly, there's a lot of confusion around what goes into the session and presentation layers, and there's been plenty of criticism of the OSI model. And the dirty truth is that in that so-called real world, you really don't even need to know the details here. Except, for some reason, people like to ask you about it in tech interviews, so make sure to check the Wikipedia page to have the answers they want to hear. The last layer, layer 7, and is the final layer that people like to reference, the application layer. Most distinctions for day-to-day -day discussions fall into either layer 3 and below, or layer 7. But of course, there are two additional layers that nobody ever tells you about. Layer 8, the financial layer, meaning at some point somebody has got to pay for all the things you're doing over here, and that will influence how you develop things. And then of course you realize that money doesn't come out of nowhere, and that there's yet another layer sitting on top. The political layer. The organization and how it is structured influences how the money is allocated and sets the direction for what is developed, deployed and supported. And guess what? You're almost always operating on this layer here. We'll get back to the influence of politics even on a global scale in future videos, but let's leave this theoretical layered model behind for the time being and look at some actual network traffic to better understand what this model is intended to illustrate. So let's start out capturing some network packets. We do that using the TCP dump utility, which we start and run in the background, grabbing the port 80 traffic we're interested in this example. With that TCP dump running in the background, we make a simple HTTP head request to the CS Stevens website. We don't care about the output, we just care about the packets that are collected. Okay, we bring TCP dump back to the foreground and interrupt it. Change the ownership on the output file, so we can operate on it as a normal user, and then we simply take a look at the first packet captured in this file. We see a lot of information here, and being able to make sense of raw TCP dump output is a critical skill for system administrators, as we oftentimes have to troubleshoot network connections and protocols. So what are we looking at here? How does this relate to the OSI model we just showed before? Tell you what, let's first go back to the much simpler TCP IP stack model. Don't worry, we'll get back to the TCP dump output in a second. So the TCP IP model also uses layers, but unlike the OSI model, it only uses four layers. And as shown in this illustration, these layers are actually more like layers of an onion and that each one wraps the other. That is, we're talking about encapsulation which is nicely illustrated here, where we see that the link layer provides a header and a footer that encapsulates the internet layer, where we're using, in this example anyway, the IP protocol, which adds its header and encapsulates the TCP packet, which finally includes the application data. So let's map these layers to what we're seeing in the TCP dump output. Okay, so let's look at the details in the hexadecimal output here. The first 24 bytes include the link layer information. The next two bytes tell us what type of protocol is encapsulated, IP in this case. 
which we find in these 24 bytes, with the remainder being the TCP payload. This nicely illustrates how the encapsulation model translates to actual bytes in our packet capture. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at what exactly is in those bytes. The first 12 bytes here are the link layer destination address, with the second 12 bytes as the source address. What exactly are there? Well, our link layer data link protocol here is MAC, Medium Access Control. Our network interface, ZNet0 in this case, has a MAC address as shown here. Since, rather conveniently, the MAC address already is in hex, we don't even have to convert anything. Instead, can see it right here in the packet. E07663723900. Okay, so that's our source address, the NIC we're sending the data through. What about the destination address? We can look at our ARP cache table, which keeps the mapping of the MAC addresses to IP addresses on its layer 2 network that it's seen. So here we see that our destination MAC address, 001B21735955A, maps to the IP address 166847192 which we can see to be our default gateway. So this makes sense. No matter where we are actually looking to send our IP packet, if it's not on our layer 2 network segment, then we have to hand it off to the default gateway, so it can be routed correctly. And that is why our link layer frame has the destination address of our default gateway. So our default gateway will then take this packet and unwrap the link layer information to look at the IP packet inside. What does an IP packet look like? Well, it looks like this. This is the structure of the IPv4 packet as defined in RFC 791, which then allows us to also look at all the different bytes we observed in the TCP dump packet and make sense of them. So the first byte here encodes the IP version, 4 in this case, as well as the total length of the IP header, 5 32-bit chunks adding up to 20 bytes which we see in our TCP dump output up here. The 5 up here then also tells us that in this case there are no IPv4 options or padding, allowing you to determine where the payload, the TCP data in our case, begins. In the next byte, we encode the differentiated services code point, or DSCP bits, often used for quality of service assurances as well as the Explicit Congestion Notification, or ECN, field, which, in our case, is all zero. The next two bytes specify the total length of the packet, including the header and data. For us, this is 60 bytes in total, already telling us that the TCP payload is 40 bytes in size after you subtract the 20-byte IP header. Then we have two bytes for identification, which is commonly used to identify IP fragments for reassembly if the packet had to be fragmented in transit. Again, that's all zero for us here. The next two bytes again encode two pieces of information. The flags, with the don't fragment bit being set here, and the remaining 13 bits used to identify the offset if your packet had been fragmented. Since it wasn't, that's zero, and we end up with hex 4000 for these two bytes. Next is the 1 byte TTL, telling us how many hops the packet may at most take. We specify the, the default, 64 here, which then becomes 40 hex over here. After that comes the byte specifying what protocol the encapsulated payload is. For TCP, we specify 6 over here. Then we have two bytes for the IP header checksum, which is a very simple once complement checksum providing minimal corruption protection. For us here, that's hex B903. The remaining 64 bits specify the source and destination IPv4 addresses, which we know to be 32 bits in size each. The source address here is hex 16540763 and the destination address hex 9 b f 6 0 b Since there are no IP options in this packet, all the remaining bytes in our TCP dump output up here 
and thus the TCP payload. But wait, what are the IP addresses? We know what they are in hex, but let's see why we picked these values. We know that these four bytes here are the source address, and these four bytes the destination address. Let's convert the hex numbers of the source address into decimal. We can use the BC tool for this and set the input base to 16, which then lets us simply enter the hex numbers and it'll spit out the decimal values. So value A6 hex becomes 166 decimal, 54 hex 84 decimal, and so on and so on. Let's look again at our NIC and see what IP address it has. Well, what do you know? Our IP address is indeed 166.84.7.99. So that's our source address. What about the destination address? Well, since I somewhat frequently have a need to convert addresses like this, I created a shell function to do the translation from hex to decimal for me more easily. The slides have a link at the end to a shell file that contains several of these functions if you're interested. Anyway, so our destination address is hex 9 bf 638 0 b or 155.246.56.11, which isn't all that surprising since we had tried to make an HTTP request to www.cs.stevens.edu which translates to 155.246.56.11, the destination address we observed in the TCP dump output. So we've successfully and completely dissected the link layer and network layer information from the single packet we captured. Congratulations! Now as you may know, there are other tools that allow you to inspect captured packets. One of them is the popular Wireshark application. If we load our PCAP file into Wireshark with that single packet set, then we can observe all the same data we pulled out of the raw hex bytes we observed. Like before, we find the link layer source and destination addresses over here, the IP v4 information over here, broken down by version, length, DSCP and ECN bits, length identification, flags, offset, TTL, protocol, checksum, and finally the source and destination addresses, as well as the remainder TCP payload. As you can tell, Wireshark is really a useful tool, as it can easily identify all these bits for us, but I do think it's important for system administrators to be able to tease out the information they need using TCP dump, which is why I showed the breakdown one by one in this video. Ok, let's take a break here and recap real quick. We've name dropped the OSI model as required, but considered that the simpler 4 layer TCP IP model may perhaps be a bit more useful. We've observed that the IPv4 IFC is not lying to us. The information it prescribed is in fact found exactly where it says it should be. And I think that's a very useful lesson too. You can understand any application or protocol if you can follow the specification. And the internet RFCs are usually very well written and easy to understand. And I also hope that I showed that Wireshark, as useful as it is, is not some weird sort of unknowable magic, but rather is just the application of understanding the protocol. I think you've seen how you could build a tool like Wireshark based on what you've learned here, at least conceptually. But this only really got us to the IP layer, and we have still a lot of topics left to discuss in our coverage of networking here, so let's take a look at what's coming next. In the next video, we'll discuss IPv4 subnetting before we then move on to IPv6 to see how that differs. After that, we'll make a short detour, up the stack to layer 9, the political layer, and discuss how the internet is administered and controlled on a very high level, and with a focus on IP space allocation and management. But we'll also talk a bit about the physical structure of the internet. I know, I know, it's all just a series of tubes. Or is it? We'll find out. So until the next time, and thanks for watching. Cheers!